<clears throat> All right, today we're going to end the Gilded Ages, so we're going to kind of transition into the Progressive Era, but we've got one last thing to talk about, and that's the populist movement or the people's movement. Uh, politics in the Gilded Age uh, were dominated by the two major political parties, the Republicans and the Democrats, but underneath the surface, there was a third party movement brewing. Um, this would culminate in the People's Party in the 1890s. Now, the populists would focus on farm and labor issues, and they attempted to restructure the political landscape to meet the challenges they saw industrialization pose to the nation. Now, after the Civil War, many people moved west to start farming. Uh, Congress had passed the Homestead Act, and Indian wars and treaties had led to the United States acquiring much more land for settlement. Some farmers did very well when they went out west, but many others did not. Farmers faced lots of problems during the Gilded Age. Uh, they faced debt, bad weather, crop failures, uh, the tariff, overproduction, low farm prices, competition from other farmers and farmers from other countries, high railroad rates to ship their produce, uh, and loneliness. So farmers deal with a lot of things during the Gilded Ages. Um, one of the ironies was that as farming became more mechanized and more efficient, it led to overproduction and therefore lower prices. And as you can see from this chart, as the Gilded Age progresses, it took less and less work to produce more and more food. So farmers are becoming very efficient during this period and there's just too many farmers producing too much food. And one thing I do want to point out is industrialization in America could not have happened without the role that farmers played. Um, millions and millions and millions of people throughout the Gilded Age moved from the farms to the cities. People could not have moved to the cities in such large numbers if farmers weren't becoming more efficient and producing more crops to feed those in the city. Now some of this is also because industrialization makes farmers more efficient. So in some ways, uh, agricultural, uh, the farmers help industrialization and industrialization helps agriculture. So it's kind of this circle where they both benefit each other. Now, one of the first efforts to help farmers in the Gilded Age was done by a man named Oliver Kelly. Uh, in 1867, he founded a group called the Grange. They're also called the Patrons of Husbandry. Uh, this group, the Grange, was basically a social and an educational group. Uh, the organization grew to several hundred chapters across the nation by the early 1870s. When the Panic of 1873 hit, uh, a depression occurred after that that lasted till about 1877. Uh, during this depression, farm prices plummeted. Uh, the Grangers took a number of actions in the political arena. Um, by 1874, the Grangers controlled a number of state legislators, legislatures in the Midwest they enacted what were known as Granger Laws. Now these laws represent some of the earliest attempts to regulate corporations, railroad, and banks. These Granger Laws set max maximum rates for shipping grain. They banned the railroads from giving rebates to preferred customers. Um, farmers really saw themselves at the mercy of the railroads. Because without the railroads, the farmers can't ship their produce back to back east to market. And oftentimes, there's only one railroad in the area. So you can't just say, well, I'm not going to use your railroad, I'll use someone else's. So the railroads can really charge what the farmers whatever they want. Now, another group forms uh, in the 1880s ca called the Farmers Alliance. Farmers' alliances sought to organize individual farmers together into cooperatives so they would have more power. Uh, this is sort of like workers and, and unions. Farmers believed that if they banded together, they could get better prices for their produce. In the 1880s, some 6 million people belonged to farmers' alliances. And in 1889, the northern and southern farmers' alliances joined into a single national organization. There's also another kind of group out there called... Uh, the National Greenback Party or Greenbackers. They basically wanted the federal government to keep in circulation large amounts of greenbacks that were printed during the Civil War. Um, during the Gilded Age, there's a big fight over monetary policy. Should the United States be a gold standard country? Should the United States be a gold and silver country? 
gold standard, silver standard country, or should they also have paper money floating around there? Typically, big business and conservative interests want only a gold standard, whereas farmers and workers, they tend to want gold and silver and uh, paper currency out there. Uh, if you're only on the gold standard, that means there's less money to go around, and usually the rich control this. If you allow silver and paper money into the economy, that creates more money in a sense, and it allows uh, farmers access to more money, or so the theory goes. Now, um, in Kansas, the populist movement kind of gets started. It started in other places in the Midwest as well. But one of the more famous people from Kansas, uh, a former school teacher, Mary Elizabeth Lease, she kind of raises her voice in protest in the 1880s and 1890s. Now she speaks in support of lots of issues, women's suffrage, unions, uh, farmers, and what they're going through. Um, she would go around and give speeches and say things like this. It is no longer a government of the people, by the people, and for the people but a government of Wall Street, by Wall Street, and for Wall Street. So farmers and populists tend to attack bankers and Wall Street um, as kind of corrupting American life, American uh, politics. Now by 1890, she had helped support kind of the founding of the People's Party, uh, or the Populist Party in Kansas. Um, women play a big role in the populist movement. And if you think about this, this makes a lot of sense. Women in the West, the Midwest, were frontier women. Um, they played just as much of a role as their husbands kind of in conquering the frontier and setting up farms. Women worked outside with their husbands alongside them, plowing the fields and planting, you know, wheat or corn. Um, so women play a big role in the populist movement. Uh, Mary Lease is famous for saying that farmers in the Midwest needed to, quote, raise less corn and more hell. So, you know, fire up people, get them, get them involved in politics. Uh, in, in 1890, there's statewide elections in Kansas. The populace stun everybody, and they win control of the state legislature from the Republican Party. They win something like 70% uh, of the seats in the Kansas state legislature. Um, I think they win over 90 seats, um, dethroning the Republicans in Kansas. Later in 1892 in St. Louis, they form the National People's or Populist Party. So this is kind of the official start of the nationwide party. Um, the populists said this, There are but two sides. On the one side are the allied hosts of monopolies, the money power, great trusts, and rail railroad corporations. On the other are the farmers, laborers, merchants, and all the people who produce wealth. Between these two, there is no middle ground. So populists tend to say, look, the workers, the farmers, the merchants, they're the ones who create wealth. They actually plant things or build things in the factories. The big capitalists and the bankers, they don't actually produce things. They just shuffle money around on paper. Um, what good are they to society, to the economy? Now, the populists draft something called the Omaha Platform in 1892. This is basically a list of what they want to accomplish politically. And I want you to pay attention to this. This is going to be important when we get into the progressives. But here's some of what they wanted. They wanted the coinage of silver in addition to gold. They wanted federal loans to farmers. They wanted a graduated income tax. They wanted public ownership of railroads and the telegraph system. Uh, they wanted the right to organize, and they wanted a ban on private armies breaking strikes. So they wanted a ban on things like the Pinkertons who helped break the strike or attempt to break the strike during the Homestead strike. Um, they wanted an eight-hour workday. They wanted a free ballot, so they kind of want to reform the way voting is done. They want pensions for uh, Civil War soldiers. They want Im uh, immigration restrictions because they believe that the more immigrants that come to America, the lower that drives down wages. They want things like the initiative and the referendum. So they want the people to directly be able to pass laws, not just their elected representatives. Uh, they want a one term limit for the president. They want no federal subsidies for corporations. So they want the government to stop giving handouts to corporations. Uh, they want to take land away from the railroad companies and the speculators and give them to people willing to farm and settle them. 
They also want the direct election of senators. So these are just a number of things they want. Uh, in the Omaha platform, the populace said, we believe that the power of the government, in other words, of the people, should be expanded as rapidly and as far as the good sense of an intelligent people and the teachings of experience shall justify to the end that oppression, injustice, and poverty should eventually cease in the land. So the populace are all about giving the government more control, more power um, in order to enact reforms. Now the populace decide to run a candidate for the president in 1892. Um, they nominate James B. Weaver, a Union Army veteran, for president, and they, they nominate James G. Field, a Confederate Army veteran, for vice president. So this is kind of an interesting thing. You know, the Civil War is still on people's minds. There's still Civil War veterans everywhere. Um, the Republicans nominate Benjamin Harrison for president, and the Democrats nominate Grover Cleveland for president. Now, normally, candidates didn't campaign. But Weaver knew that since he's a third party candidate, it's going to be harder for him to win elections. So he actually does campaign uh, nationally. So he kind of breaks with tradition. Now, in the end, the populists can't can't win. They don't capture the presidency. Grover Cleveland wins the election of 1892, defeating Weaver and Harrison together. Um, now, the election is not. Uh, a defeat necessarily for the populace. There's a lot of ways that you could count this as a victory for the populace. They win over 1,500 local elections. They elect five senators and 10 representatives to the House. And they also capture three governorships. Um, as you can kind of see uh, from these election maps, they do win some states presidentially. They do win some electoral votes. But even states they lost, they almost captured. So um, Nebraska, they didn't win, but they did win 45% of that state, so they came very close to winning it. Oregon, they won 44%, so they came close to capturing Oregon's electoral votes. Now in the midterm elections of 1894, the populists try again. This election is coming in the midst of a depression. We had had a panic in 1893, and by 1894, it's a depression. There's something like 25% unemployment, and the Pullman strike is going on. So the populists believe it's a good year for kind of third-party politics. <clears throat> something new is also happening in American history in 1894. A group of men called Coxey's Army is marching on Washington. Uh, this was the first national march on Washington. Jacob Coxey and hundreds of men marched from Ohio to Washington. Uh, they camped, encamped along the way in Ohio and Pennsylvania on their way to Washington. Um, they stop in numerous towns where they're fed and welcomed and encouraged on their march. Um, their goal was to make it to Washington and demand that the government give them employment. Uh, a lot of people during the Gilded Age, when they're out of work, they don't demand welfare, they demand a job. Um, they want to work, but they just can't find work. Now, in 1894, when they're marching on Washington, Grover Cleveland is president, and here's what he said in his inaugural address. He said, The lessons of paternalism ought to be unlearned. Uh, and the better lesson taught that while the people should patriotically and cheerfully support their government, its functions do not include the support of the people. So Grover Cleveland and most politicians of this era believe that the government's job is not to support the people. The government's job is basically to stay out of things. Um, so this is a totally different era than what we're used to today. Now, Coxey was going to present Congress with a petition that they give Americans who were unemployed jobs, building roads and schools and other infrastructure projects. Now, what ends up happening is Coxey marches to Washington, and when he goes to the Capitol, he's arrested for walking on the grass. He gets fined $5 and sentenced to 20 days in jail. He never gets to present his petition to Congress. So kind of remember this when we move on later into American history. You know, in 1894, there's a huge depression. You have people marching on Washington asking for relief, and the federal government basically says, it's not our job to help you in tough economic times. Remember this when we get to the 1930s and talk about the Great Depression. People are going to start demanding uh, help from the government, and Franklin Roosevelt is going to totally change American politics and start, start trying to help people 
Uh, whether or not he does, I'll kind of let you decide once we get there. Now, the populists hope that their victories in 1892 and 1894 will bode well for them in 1896, which is another presidential election year. In 1896, the Republicans nominate William McKinley of Ohio. He had been a former congressman and a governor from Ohio. McKinley is considered a conservative Republican. He supports the gold standard. He supports a high tariff. These tend to help uh, businessmen. The populists and the Democrats do something kind of interesting. They end up nominating the same candidate for president, William Jennings Bryan of Nebraska. Uh, William Jennings Bryan is a young politician uh, who supports the free coinage of silver and a lot of other things the populists stand for. Uh, during the election, he gives one of the most famous political speeches of the Gilded Age. It's called the Cross of Gold speech. And William Jennings Bryan says, You shall not press down upon the brow of labor this crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind on a cross of gold. So William Jennings Bryan is kind of alluding to Christian metaphors to uh, awaken the nation that you can't mistreat people by hurting the economy and helping only the rich by having a gold standard. He wants more silver in the economy. Now, uh, McKinley and Bryan run against each other in the election, and McKinley wins. He wins with 51% of the vote. Um, you can look at this map and kind of see what states he carried. Basically, the industrial states um, and some of the Midwest McKinley carries, while Bryan, who's a Democrat, carries the South because the South always votes Democrat because of segregation and kind of leftover feelings from the Civil War. Now this election, 1896, it's the last gasp of the, the populist party. Uh, they'll fade from the American scene, but many of their causes will be picked up by a new group of formers, the progressives. So as we move on and talk about the progressive era, just keep in mind, a lot of these populist ideas are gonna get co-opted and adopted by the progressives.